There is a comedian named Bill Engvall. And one of the sketches he's known for is, here's your sign. And it's this routine framework that he commonly uses. And it begins by stating that stupid people should wear signs that say, I'm stupid. He'll go on then to tell several anecdotes in which people will do something and there will be someone who asks an asinine question and the answer is very sarcastic and it's followed by, here's your sign. For example, a trucker gets his truck stuck under an overpass and the responding policeman comes up and says, hey, get your truck stuck? <laughs> and the trucker says, no sir, I was delivering that overpass and I ran out of gas. <laughs> Here's your sign. Sometimes we go looking for signs for our future. We look for people to give us these signs. There are reality shows like Long Island Medium where people are touted as being able to see the future. Or we'll go to see a psychic. For the most part, most of us have a healthy skepticism for these kinds of people. We don't give it a lot of credence in this generation and we don't necessarily believe that this is possible. And when the predictions that they give us don't come to fruition, we point to that as proof that we can disbelieve. It's my belief that most of these people, most of these folks, there is a healthy dose of showmanship, a razzle-dazzle than actual predicting. They are for the most part, very good readers of social cues and body language, and they use that to give you their predictions. They're attuned to what you want to hear, and they package that up and give it back to you in one form or another. That's not to say that I don't think it's possible. Our God can do anything. And there may be people who do have this gift from God, but they're lumped together with all these others and we don't believe in them. And then there are scientific prognosticators. We quite often call them weathermen. Or people like who, the ones who write the farmer's almanac, right? Incidentally, this is what they're predicting for the winter of 2018, 2019, just so you know. For much of Ontario, expect to see wide swings in the weather pendulum from very mild to very cold and periods of tranquil weather mixed with occasional spells of tempestuous conditions. I'm sorry, isn't that every Ontario winter? <laughs> right? We put great faith though in these prognosticators, these weathermen. I, is it just me or is there any other job in the world where you can be wrong so often and still have a job to come to in the morning? I found this great weatherman joke. I'm going to share it with you. Once upon a time, there was a king and he loved fishing, wanted to go fishing. He called the weather forecaster, the royal weather forecaster, and asked them about what the conditions would be like. And the weatherman assured him there was no chance of rain for the coming days. He told the king what he wanted to hear. So the king takes his wife, the queen, and off they go. And on the way, they met a farmer with a donkey. Upon seeing the king, the farmer said, listen, you're going to want to go back to the castle because there is going to be this torrential rain down, rain down on you. And the king very polite, very considerate, and he said to him, you know, I have great faith in my royal weather forecaster. He's extremely educated, he's experienced, he's very professional, I pay him really well, and he gave me a different forecast. I trust him, and I'll continue on my way, and so, so he did. 
And then, of course, it poured, just poured. And the king and queen were totally soaked. Their entourage laughed at them because their beautiful robes were just in disarray. And he was absolutely furious. He went back to the palace and he finds the re royal weather forecaster and fires him on the spot. And then he goes to the farmer and he offers him the job. And the farmer says, well, listen, I don't know anything about forecasting, but my donkey's ears will go down <laughs> when the weather is going to be bad. And, and that means that it's gonna rain. So instead, the king hired the donkey <laughs> on the spot. And thus became, began the ancient old practice of hiring, think another word for donkey, <laughs> to work in the government and occupy its highest positions. <laughs> so predictors and prognosticators, what about prophets? We have a bias against these folks too, those people that stand on the street corner and tell you that the end of the world is coming. That's what we might call prophets in this day and age. But the prophet Isaiah from the Old Testament, he was one of four major prophets that are in that portion of Hebrew scripture along with Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And a prophet is one who speaks in the name of the Lord. In fact, Moses tells us in Deuteronomy 18, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word which the Lord has not spoken. And Isaiah is highly regarded as one of the great prophets in the Bible. His name actually means Yahweh, the Lord, is salvation. He lived in Jerusalem and he was very dismayed at what was going on with the Israelites. They continued to turn away from God and their moral fiber was breaking down. And so in about 740 BCE to 686 BCE, he started to prophesy and tell people what the Lord had said and they didn't always want to hear it. He spoke a lot about justice. In fact, the word justice appears in Isaiah's prophecies more than any other book of the Bible. But he also speaks about the coming Messiah. He speaks a lot about what will happen as the Lord, the Messiah, comes into this world and as the Lord, the Messiah, leaves this world the coming birth and the coming death. In fact, one third of the books, uh, pardon me, the chapters in Isaiah refer to Jesus Christ. And we pay attention to this, but we, we actually don't pay attention to all of it. Just like the Israelites, some of the things are not what we want to hear. The people of Israel didn't want to hear Isaiah's prophecies because they were telling them what they were doing wrong. They were telling them that what they had in mind was not what God had in mind for them. It wasn't what they wanted to hear, but it was definitely what they needed to hear. And I think we are very much the same. We want to hear what we want to hear. We don't want to be bogged down with doomsday predictions, those pesky things. We don't, want, we don't want to be told what we're doing wrong. We don't want to be told what we should do to correct our actions. That's just not, yeah. So we put them aside. We conveniently forget those parts and we latch on to the parts that we want to hear. The people in Isaiah's days were the absolute same. They didn't want to hear what they needed to hear, what God had given to Isaiah to share. And so they focused on the bits and pieces that they liked. The words that spoke about the coming Messiah, the prophetic words that we heard this morning, 
They wanted to hear the wonderful counselor, the prince of peace. They didn't necessarily want to hear that it would be born to a young woman, born a child, a human, a vulnerable and at risk. They wanted to hear their vision, their idea of the future. And it was a mighty king, a ferocious warrior, a triumphant warrior that would rescue them from their slavery. And Jesus did. But it wasn't the slavery that, he, that they expected. He rescued them and he rescues us from the slavery of sin. The weight of the world is on his shoulders. The weight of the sin of humanity for all time, and that's a huge and heavy burden. If you were to ask me if I believe in prophets, I'd have to say I don't disbelieve. God can and does do amazing things in our world. Things that we have no answers for or explanations for. If God can give the gift of prophecy to people like Daniel and Ezekiel and Isaiah and Jeremiah, why do we think that he couldn't do the same thing in our time? Why wouldn't he give the gift of prophecy to people now? The gifts to speak the truth. God can give gifts beyond imagining to those who are open to receive them to those who are open to hear them and to speak to them and to act on them. Some of them are preachers or teachers or just, just regular folks. And there are things that are put on their hearts and in their minds to share. Things that are from God, encouraging us to act. Things that are meant to challenge us. Things that we may not want to hear things that we may be a little uncomfortable with, but things that we need to pay attention to. But how will we know? Well, first of all, I'm going to say to you that it's probably anything that's said is not going to just be sunshine and lollipops, or at least not in its entirety. A prophecy that only speaks the good stuff, the great things, prosperity, doing what we want, and having it our way, those, I think, are the ones that are most suspect. I think that's more dreaming and wishing than actual prophecy or a vision. I mean, look at the story of Jesus Christ, his birth. We have prettied it up over the century, but it is mostly a tough, gritty story. We've heard the wonderful parts of the prophecies of Isaiah this morning. But there are other prophecies that we don't pay attention to, that we don't read as we prepare for Christmas. In Isaiah chapter 10, which is just after the first bit that Marlene read, we hear these words, and, and let me tell you, this part is pretty prophetic for our times. Doom to you who legislate evil, who make laws that make victims, laws that make misery for the poor, that rob my destitute people of dignity, exploiting defenseless widows, taking advantage of homeless children. What will you have to say on Judgment Day when doomsday arrives out of the blue? Who will you get to help you? What good will your money do you? A sorry sight you'll be then, huddled with the prisoners or just some corpses stacked in the street. Even after all this, God is still angry, his fist still raised, ready to hit them again. These are the bits we don't like to hear. We don't like to pay attention to. This call to action, this challenge to do what's right, we don't want to hear these bits. We want to gloss over them, bypass them in favor of the familiar, the nice. We want to have the pretty Christmas cards and the safe, 
sanitized prophecy of the virgin child and the wonderful Messiah, the pretty baby, rather than paying attention to God's vision, God's words, God's wisdom, and God's plan. The people of Israel, like us, took the parts they wanted to hear and they built on it. They extrapolated. They built a vision of the Messiah that they wanted. And this vision, this picture, it got even more grandiose over the time, over the centuries before it actually happened. So much so that when the promised one did appear, they didn't even recognize him. It wasn't what they wanted. It wasn't what they expected. It wasn't what they had in mind. This wasn't their Messiah, but it was God's Messiah. Because God has a way of surprising us, astounding us. God has a way of challenging us. And then, what we expect, what we have in mind, what we think should be our future isn't what God has planned for us. But even if it is, it's not necessarily on our time when we think it should happen. The people of Israel heard Isaiah's prophecies in 700 BC and had to wait 1300 years before the Messiah came. 1300 years! Doesn't that put things in perspective for us in our gotta have it now society? In our impatience? But they waited and they waited and they waited. So much so that when Christ actually came, it really took something big for them to notice. Angels showing up, singing, proclaiming, shepherds seeing angels running to see this baby before they believe it. Wealthy travelers traveling weeks or months to get there and see it. This huge light, this star that they followed. All these extraordinary bits had to happen in order for them to pay attention, to get it. I think God needs to smack us upside the head sometimes before we'll pay attention before we understand what he wants for us, what he expects of us. Maybe it takes a prediction or a prognostication or a prophecy. Maybe it takes just a sign for us to pay attention to God and to being open to hearing not just the pretty, wonderful bits that we want to hear, but the parts that are hard and tough. Maybe it takes us looking to where we will actually find the signs. Here's your sign. Amen. <laughs>